We're going to start by looking at a two transistor current source, which we can also call a current mirror. And so we'll see the reason for that name as we do our analysis a little later on. And one advantage of this two transistor current source, as we can see, as, in, as the name implies, it only has two transistors. We have Q1 over here on the left and Q2 on the right. And so of course fewer transistors or in general fewer components is going to translate to a cheaper end product. So we're gonna come back through and we're gonna fill in some of these voltage polarities and currents in order to analyze the circuit in a little bit. But before we get into that, and I'm gonna save some space there to come back to, um, in order for this two transistor current source to work, our two transistors, Q1 and Q2, have to be matched or identical transistors. So these must be matched. That's an A there. Or identical transistors. And so what do we mean when we say they're matched or identical? Well, of several things. So we assume that they're operating at the same temperature. We assume that they have the same current gain beta. We assume that they have the same geometry. And so the reason that's relevant is so that they have the same leakage current or our reverse saturation current. And so there's some other things that we could say, for, entrance, for instance, our dopant concentration, uh, but these are really our important ones. Um, and so you think about why these things are important. Well, think back to our equations we've seen in a previous class for our BJTs, and we see that all of these things have an effect on the relationship between our base emitter voltage and our collector current. So it's usually a good approximation that we can say our temperature is the same, um, because typically these Q1 and Q2 transistors will be close together on the IC, and then through design we can have the same beta and same geometry or leakage. And so of course our same dopant concentration, all of that stuff should be relatively consistent for the two if they're close on the IC as well. So now what we want to do is we want to come back here, and we talked about Typically we want these transistors to be operating in the forward active mode because that is the mode where we know um, very clearly what our current and voltage relationships are. So let's label some voltages in order to facilitate that discussion. So if we're looking at Q1 first, we know for instance we have our base, our collector, and our emitter. And so maybe instead of highlighting what I can do is I can put in some different colors here for a second at least. We have our collector, our base, and our emitter, just as a refresher there. And so we can, we can label some voltages. We have our base emitter voltage, and let's put a one on that because this is for Q1. And so notice I'm using uppercase variables with uppercase subscripts because we're dealing with DC values right now. And we can also label our VCE. So these are typical voltages that we would want to label. Um, we don't often label it, but if we wanted to, we could also label our base collector voltage, VBC. And so why is that relevant? Well, like we talked about in our previous video, so let me put this down here on this page. So like we talked about in our previous video, um, the biasing of these two junctions, our base collector and our base emitter, are going to determine what operating mode we're in. So if we want to be in our forward active mode, notice we said our VBE should be greater than zero and our VBC should be less than or equal to zero. So that's in that bottom right quadrant there. And so most of the time we're going to be dealing with this case where we're sort of right on this line here where our VBC is equal to zero. And that's acceptable because our transistor isn't going to switch modes right at that line. It's usually somewhat of a gray area. So let's come back up here and look at what assumptions need to be made in order for our transistors to be operating in that region. And then we're gonna do our circuit analysis. So let's start with looking at our transistor Q1 on the left. So for our Q1, we see that our circuit is actually shorted between our collector and our base right here. And so of course what that means is that our VBC is equal to zero. And 
as a consequence of that, we also have that our VCE1 is equal to VBE1. So I can add a one there as well. Um, so if we have sufficient bias, so if we have sufficient bias to turn on our base emitter junction, we'll be in the forward active mode. And so of course our bias is coming from our V plus and V minus here. So sufficient bias such that VBE1 is equal to VBE on of that particular transistor, then our transistor is going to be in our forward active mode as desired. So now we can do a similar thing for our Q2. And so for Q2, let's label a few things as well. So we have our base emitter, VBE2 base emitter voltage, and our VCE2. And typically we won't label it, but we can for this time, we can say this is our VBC2 here. And so for this one, we can't see as clearly because we don't have really the whole circuit. So this is going to be our circuit that creates the current, but where I have this dot, dot, dot up to the top, this is where our load is going to be connected. So our exact conditions of this Q2 is gonna depend on what we connect, and we'll talk about that in some later videos. But for this case, let's say for Q2, we're just going to assume it's forward active. So we're gonna assume forward active mode. And so what that's going to mean then is that our VCE2 has to be greater than or equal to our VBE2, which has to be turned on. And so basically all that's saying is that this VCE2 voltage here has to be large enough such that our VBC2 voltage is negative or zero. Okay. So if all of that is true, then what we can do is we can go ahead and analyze our circuit with our IV equations that we've had in a previous class. So let me just bring this circuit down here. So let's copy that and let's come down to a new page. Okay, so here's our circuit. So we can also add in some other currents and voltages to help us. Um, so we can, we will typically call this current through our R1, our reference current. So I ref. And with that, what we can do is we can go ahead and do a, an analysis on sort of the left hand side in order to calculate our I ref value. So we can say, switch back to black here, doing a KVL and using our Ohm's law for that resistor R1, what we can do is we can say our V plus is equal to V minus plus VBE1 plus R1 times I ref. And so if you have trouble seeing that analysis, of course, feel free to let me know. But essentially what we're doing is we're saying, if we're starting down here at this potential, we're gonna go up to this path. So I'm at V minus, I add VBE, and then here I'm not going through anything. I add this voltage drop here, and now I'm at V plus. So essentially that's the KVL path that we just did. So now what we can do is we can rearrange this equation in order to solve for our reference current value. So we can say our I ref is equal to, we're gonna have a fraction and the numerator of that fraction will have V plus minus V minus minus VBE one divided by R one. So let's box this in in red. This is gonna be an important equation for our uh, two transistor current source and to be consistent with the notes, I'm gonna call that equation one. Okay, so what we're really interested in though is the current that's gonna be going to the load. And so we can see the current going to the load, switch to blue, we can call this our collector current for our Q2. So we can call this IC2. 
or we could just call it I not. So this is like our output current. Um, okay, so really we want to figure out what that is. So how do we relate from I ref to I not? So let's take a look at how we do that. Okay, so let's switch back to black here. So one thing to note is that our VBE1 is equal to VBE2. And so we could see that by doing a KVL around this bottom loop here. So we can say VBE1 is equal to VBE2. Now, because Q1 and Q2 are matched, that means that we're gonna have the same currents in these transistors. So matched. And I guess to be complete, let me say they're matched transistors. then what that means is that we have the two collector currents are the same. So IC1 equals IC2. And of course, if we have the same betas, that means IB1 equals IB2. And so just as a quick refresher, you might recall from our previous class, in general, we had said our collector current is equal to our reverse saturation current exponential of our VBE divided by VT. So where our VT term depended on the temperature, our IS depends on the geometry, our dopant concentration, and then of course the relation between IB and IC depends on beta. So all of this is taken care of when we say that they are matched transistors, because we're saying all of those things are the same for the two transistors. So that's gonna simplify things a lot because we can say those things are the same. So let's come to our circuit now and add in some more currents for our transistors. So we already have our IC2, but where is our IC1? Um, so we need to be careful because our IC1 does not equal I ref because our I ref is actually supplying our IC1 here and twice our, ba our base current because we have two IB coming down here because we have it splitting one going this way, one going this way. So we have IB1 and IB2, and because we know IB1 and IB2 are equal to one another, we know that that value coming in must be two IB2. So what we can do then is we can do a KCL at our Q1 collector. So we can do a KCL right here. So from KCL, let me just scroll up so we can see. So we see we have I ref coming in, we have IC1 coming out, and then we have IB1 plus IB2 coming out. So I've kind of done in two steps, uh, combined two steps into one by saying two IB is IB1 plus IB2. So let me just come back down here and write that. So we have I ref, which was coming in the top, is equal to IC1, which is coming out the bottom, plus IB1 plus IB2. Okay, well, we know that our IBs are equal, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and write that this is two IB2, because we know that IB1 is the same as IB2, so I'm just gonna decide, hey, let's get rid of IB1 and keep IB2. So what we can then do is we can relate that to IC2, so we can say IC1 plus two now remember we can relate collector and base currents with our beta term. So IB2 is just IC2 divided by beta, and that's the same beta for both transistors. And so I've actually made a mistake here, but we can say this is just IC2 because we're saying that our collector currents are equal as well. So now that we have this, we can factor out our IC2, and we can say this is IC2 times the quantity of one plus two divided by beta. And now, of course, what we can do is we can solve for our IC2, which is equal to our I out. So remember up here, we had defined that as our output current. So we can say IC2 is equal to I out is equal to I ref in our numerator divided by one plus two over 
beta. And so this is going to be our other important equation for our two transistor current source. And so it's worth keeping in mind that this is for the ideal case when we have perfectly matched transistors and we're not considering the early effect. So in some later videos, we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at two of those things and how accounting for those changes this result slightly. slightly. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna look at a simple example on how to use these equations. But of course, if you have any questions about any part of the derivation or the application of our transistor current source, please don't hesitate to let me know.